Welcome back to It's Your Environment. Uh, Dave Curtis is my guest, and uh, we're learning a little bit about how we move this freight from the ocean, which really starts in San Francisco or Seattle, and the kind of equipment that comes up the big river. But when you get near Bethel, which is kind of your central area, then the needs and therefore the equipment change somewhat, don't they? Yes, they do. Uh, we will bring a, a small bulldozer along for landing improvements. A lot of the landings that we will hit in these various Eskimo villages are unimproved, meaning essentially in the springtime, due to erosion, they're mud and they're wet. And that mud on the yukon Kuskokwim Delta is soft. And our forklift weighs close to 50,000 pounds. It's an off-road four-wheel drive machine that's meant to do just this. But if we bring that machine off in the wrong circumstances, it, it buries itself and it's a real trick to get out as you imagine in these containers. Generally we stick to the 10 foot by 20 foot containers which are filled with anything that uh, the shippers fill them with. And uh, they're heavy and they're difficult to move. And some of the things you move include construction equipment, uh, gravel, other building materials, medical supplies, school supplies, just about everything that these people in the villages are going to need during the next winter, that's the only chance to get it. That is the only chance to get it, and we do haul a lot of construction and equipment. Uh, Village Safe Water does a lot of work up there, trying to improve the water systems for, for many of these villages that uh, don't have improved water systems. And there's some prospecting going on for different uh, precious metals in that area. I suppose that that contributes somewhat to the load. Potentially there's a, a large uh, gold mine called uh, Donlin Creek that will, will potentially be going in upriver and uh, they're doing a lot of exploration and potentially going to be hauling a lot of materials and construction equipment up there. Once in a while I get a call from you in the summer and you say uh, today we're going to go up to and then you mentioned the uh, some village that I can't pronounce and um, you go way way up how f how far do you go up even north of Bethel oftentimes we will travel up as far as 350 to 400 miles up the Kuskokwim River and you've got problems with the lack of water sometimes and uh, basically you can't go any farther we have had a trip or two where the uh, the draft of our barge and tug was just simply uh, too deep to allow us to go up to, to the final destination. I know that um, you did your master's thesis in the culture of these folks in Alaska, uh, the culture that's been very interesting to you. What do you learn as you go into the villages about what's happening to their lives? Oh, well, you know how much I enjoy the Yupik culture and the Yupik Eskimo people. And uh, of course, after as many years as I've worked up there, I've, I've got a number of friends in many of the villages and I, I think the thing that I find most disheartening is the economy and the lack of of good jobs for for people and with the fishing industry going downhill like it has I, I just uh, I feel that they need another source of uh, income what do these young folks have to look forward to now they do have schools and I know they have dedicated teachers but uh, do they have to leave the villages to have any kind of real prospects for their generation's life? A lot of them do. And there are some programs where they can get into uh, firefighting and, and other services like that. But of course, then they'll be outsourced to um, the lower 48 to do those things. Something that has intrigued me when I've been up there is uh, they get to watch the same programs on television that the kids in New York are watching. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, none of those things are accessible to them. And I wonder what kind of frustration that causes for some of these young people. Some of them, I'm sure, just can't wait to graduate from high school and get out. But they're getting out to a harsh reality that's different than their harsh reality, but something they have no experience to prepare themselves for. That's true, but oddly enough, and statistics show that a lot of these kids that do want to get out of the villages right away and, and, and do go to Anchorage or find their way down to the lower 48 to go to school actually end up coming back to the villages because they miss that, that type of uh, environment. Well, there are some real family uh, strengths and benefits to the culture, uh, and maybe you can tell us about some of the things that you admire about that. 
Well, there's a, a real sense of family and, and core values there, and of course in, in villages that range in population from 300 to 1,000 to some of the larger ones, it, families are, are very important and there's still a, a strong sense of community and helping each other out and in a subsistence-based lifestyle where they're relying on, on salmon and caribou and moose. There's a lot of sharing and things going on that uh, we haven't seen really in our society since the, you know, for a hundred years. Uh, now I know you work all the time up there. You keep telling me you work all the time uh -huh. up there. But uh, uh, in spite of the fact that it's daylight most of the time and you probably are going, whenever the, there's enough light for you to be on the river, you're on the river. You do uh, sneak away once or twice a summer and you send us some wonderful salmon fillets and uh, you must do some bartering in the villages because among the things that you have sent the family and we appreciate are some of these hats and we've got a couple of examples before us. Tell us how that takes place. Well, I, in terms of the fishing, the, one of the most important things that uh, I like while I'm up there is the traditional smoked salmon and uh, a lot of the natives take great pride and care to smoke this salmon and uh, of course then that is going to last them all winter long and uh, it, it's preserved in such a manner so I have shared some of that and you're referring to the uh, fur molokais which are which are still used today and uh, I find it the warmest hat I've ever I've ever worn and a lot of them are made out of seal skin and, and beaver and beautiful I mean for example the spotted one what what kind of a fur is that that is uh, ermine that is going down the sides and it's surrounded by a beaver ring there and then that seal on the uh, outer side. Well, they are beautiful. Uh, people who have seen them on this television show always call me and want to buy one from me, which of course I'm not going to sell them. They're uh -huh. uh, well appreciated gifts. But I've only worn them a couple of times outside and even below zero weather. They're too warm. They're absolutely uh, for Alaskan weather, not for Wisconsin weather. I think they're intended for sub-zero temperatures. Let's take our second break. Time's going in a hurry and when we come back I'd like to talk about some of your favorite places in Alaska because You've been all over Alaska, and I'm going to find out where you'd go on vacation. Okay. We'll be right back. Well, Dave's got a good point. Kodiak is beautiful and a wonderful place for a vacation for the whole family, or just for a hunting or fishing trip for you alone. Sitka has just as many fans. What a beautiful island. And interestingly, you can take the ferry, which is a very inexpensive, gorgeous trip, very leisurely from almost anywhere in coastal Alaska or even from Washington, and you can have a layover in Sitka or Juneau or Ketchikan. That inside passage is absolutely beautiful, and the ferry is subsidized by oil money, and so it's not very expensive. My suggestion is you grab a mile post. A new mile post, available at your bookstore, comes out every year and tells you about the thousands of places you might want to visit in Alaska. Pick one, go there this year, and you'll never forget 2008. That's my opinion. I'm George Curtis.